Interestingly, this week, we saw news out of China that twin babies had um, one of the first gene editing procedures done. And we'd like to hear your views. I know this has been, in some circles, people have been skeptical. There's been criticism and concern about what this means. Um, and then there's some questions about are we, how far are we from this being accepted? So if you want to start there, I think it would be an important topic to. Sure, sure. And thanks, on. Cynthia. It's great to be here today. Uh, what I know from what I've read, I find it deeply concerning. That is the reports of uh, gene editing of embryos uh, you know, during the conception process to be deeply concerning. In fact, I, I think it's ill-advised and unacceptable. Uh, you know, there is so much promise in CRISPR-based science and technologies for doing responsible uh, gene editing in various different ways. But I, I, in thinking about this, I think we can harken back to the 1970s when recombinant DNA was first shown to work scientifically. That is, you could take human genes and put them into bacteria and make protein. And that was the birth of biotech. But there were a lot of appropriate concerns then about how to responsibly use recombinant DNA. And we came together as a society with scientists, with people from the lay public, to look at how recombinant DNA should be regulated, how it should be overseen. And as a result, tremendous human benefit has come from using recombinant DNA. Just think about the number of advances, human insulin, growth hormone, a host of different uh, drugs being developed based on the technology, really with little or no adverse consequences from the technology itself. Now, I think we can achieve a similar outcome in CRISPR, but it's certainly not from what I've read um, from the reports of what's been done most recently in, in China. I, um, I really would say that, that that's, that's irresponsible. How, how far do you think we are from a time in which we can edit DNA in a way to advance human health for the good and use CRISPR in the way that it's potentially going to be harnessed? I think it's very close. We see a lot of uh, effort going on at institutions around the world in the treatment of monogenic disorders, disorders that are caused by mutations in a single gene that if you can replace that gene with a functioning gene and make even a modest level of normal protein, then you correct the phenotype in people. But diseases like sickle cell disease, for example. Uh, so there's a lot of hope there. And I just really hope that uh, things don't get set back because of what we've been reading uh, coming most recently out of China in uh, the genome editing of these embryos. Well, that's a fascinating story. I'm sure we'll all be keeping an eye on it. Um, Indeed. Now, given you're located in Silicon Valley, you're at a very unique location at the intersection of technology and health. I know you've teamed up with Apple to do a study of more than 400,000 people, look at using their smartwatches to see if you can do some predictive um, work to see if a AFib is um, a diagnostic. This could be a diagnostic for AFib. Tell us a little bit about how that came together and what this could potentially achieve and where it could go. I think the Apple Heart Study is one example of what digital health has to offer in terms of prove, improving health and healthcare delivery. So atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia. It can be intermittent, so it can be hard to detect. If we had something that could monitor us for atrial fibrillation and be completely in the background, that would have a lot of health benefit. There are hundreds of thousands of people that suffer adverse consequences from atrial fibrillation every year. Many of them didn't know they had the disorder uh, until they suffered something like a stroke. So there's a lot of diagnostic need here. And these consumer-facing devices and technologies like the use of the Apple Watch to provide an indication of whether or not a person might have an arrhythmia like atrial fibrillation, we're going to see, I think, a continued increase in their utilization and in their benefit uh, for all of us as, as consumers. The key, I think, to making them successful is to have the friction, the points of friction between our interface with those devices be as minimal as possible. What we know is that if, if people have to be devoting a lot of effort to either putting on the device or, or monitoring the, the readings from the device, 
then they don't tend to get used. But, it, but the more that these diagnostics, digitally enabled, can operate in the background, the more they're going to be imp implemented seamlessly into our, into our lives. So the heart study, the Apple heart study, is one example of using consumer-facing technologies to improve prediction and prevention. There will be many, many others. And then also there's the goal of, the other goal of digital health, that is to glean information from the vast amounts of data that, ex that exists in electronic health records uh, uh, around various different delivery systems. That too offers the promise of really improving health and health care. Now, that's interesting because electronic medical records has been something where there's been a lot of reform needed and a lot of concern and a lot of effort and a lot of thought put into it, but it's taken a very long time to really build up to the point at which what you're talking about may happen where we can use these records um, in a way that might be more effective on a broad-based population level. Do you think we are getting closer to that? Or are there any roadblocks that have started to be dismantled in that regard? Or do you think that the sheer amount of information you're gathering from studies like your own are going to inform the need to do that? Talk to us a little bit, I guess, how we get there. Because electronic me medical records have been sitting out there as this potential frontier that has just not really been utilized. I, I still see a lot of hope and a tremendous amount of need of improving electronic medical records. We hosted a conference at Stanford in June of this year focused on the electronic health record. On the encouraging side, a decade ago, less than 10% of medical records from healthcare delivery systems and practicing physicians were in an electronic format. You know, when I was training, uh, I, I can't count the number of times at 2 o'clock in the morning I was asking a security guard to open a faculty member's office to track down a, a, a chart or a, an x-ray film that we needed uh, for the next day. Well now, by and large, that need has been drastically reduced because now over 80 percent of medical records in the United States are in electronic format. So that's a good step. But still, Basically, electronic health records today are electronic filing cabinets. So we've substituted a paper chart in a physical filing cabinet to a digital chart in a digital filing cabinet. We need to make the information much more interoperable, and we need to make the interface between us as patients and us as providers and the electronic health record much more fluid and much more like other computer generated interfaces that we're used to in other aspects of our lives. Yeah, it's certainly, it's always struck me as odd, as though you could just go into your bank account and move money, like boom, 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 and yet you can't, you have to literally go to your doctor's office and collect your, your medical record and carry it to the next place. I find that to be very archaic in a time that we've moved so far right. ahead on so many other frontiers. You know, healthcare today is the only industry I know of that's still using fax machines. <laughs> but you can find them everywhere. I mean, where else do you see fax machines today? I bet you don't see very many fax machines here at the Bloomberg headquarters. I don't know uh, where they but, are. Uh, but it's the truth. So we have a lot of work to do. Now, I know one area that you're very passionate about is diagnostics and developing better diagnostics. And um, tell us a little bit about the work you guys are doing at Stanford, the disease areas you're focused on, and ways that we might see disruption in our lives in the next, say, five or 10 years in terms of how we have predictive information about diseases we may potentially be at risk of. Right. Our strategic theme in Stanford Medicine is precision health. And we really distinguish that from precision medicine. Precision health is about predict, prevent, and cure precisely, but in that order, with a lot more emphasis on prediction and prevention. And yes, we're still going to have the need for the ultra-specialized cures, but if we're better able to predict and prevent disease, that need will be reduced in the future. Now, the same science that has driven remarkable advances in the treatment and curative intent for advanced diseases, that same science can be used to improve prediction and prevention. And I think we're seeing a lot of great science being done today in the area of early stage diagnostics. You know, today, oftentimes technology and medicine appropriately is criticized because it drives up cost, sometimes without improving outcomes in the way we'd like to see it. But we're starting to see some real exceptions to that rule, favorable exceptions, such as a decade ago, a crew of scientists at Stanford came up with a method of doing fetal chromosomal testing from a simple blood test in the mom. And today, the need for amniocentesis has been reduced by over 90% in the United States. So a simple blood test 
replacing an invasive procedure. And most recently, that same group of scientists has shown that fetal RNA detected in a blood test in a mom may hold a lot of information about predicting the propensity for preterm labor. So we hope that within the next three to five years, we'll also have a simple blood test that every mom can get to predict her likelihood of having a preterm delivery and therefore to prevent it. Because if we know the propensity for an illness, if we have a better understanding of that, we're very often able to engage in much more effective prevention. So I do think there's a quiet revolution going on in diagnostics. The bar is a lot higher in diagnostics than it is in therapeutics because you really, particularly for screening tests, you want to have sensitivity and specificity. And by the way, if you have a sensitive test that isn't specific, that may mean that people get a lot of care that they don't need to have that's inappropriate. So scientifically there's, and technologically there's some challenges, but uh, I don't think that should cause us to be discouraged about what the future is. Yeah, I think someone put it to me very, it had never struck me this way. They said, if you're developing a drug, it may, it, it may be okay if it doesn't work on a certain proportion of people who take it. But if you're developing a diagnostic, that cannot be the case. So the right. scientific challenge is that much greater. And then another challenge that um, I, I'd been presented with I thought was interesting is that it's, it's tough to get reimbursement for new diagnostics. So very. can you talk a little bit about that and what, how that might put a damper on innovation? Uh, it's certainly putting a damper on getting early stage investment uh, in companies that might otherwise spin out from great science related to diagnostics. I think that will change as, particularly in the United States, our reimbursement system changes. As we move more towards value-based reimbursement, then the fact that you don't get paid for diagnostic, if, if you're a delivery system with vertically integrated uh, delivery, that is, you're the insurer, you're also the provider, and, and you have the physician network, then it's not going to matter that you don't get paid for a diagnostic if it helps keep people healthy and keep people out of uh, the emergency department, for example. In a strictly fee-for-service world, those incentives are not there. So as, as the U.S. delivery system continues this migration towards more value-based reimbursement, I think the fact that diagnostics per se usually don't reimburse well will become less important if they really do help us to stay healthy for a longer period of time. Mm, yeah, that's the challenge because it takes a long time to show that. And that's part of what the insurers, I think, balk at is the idea that maybe they don't necessarily see the payoff so quickly um, and you have to prove you keep, keep someone healthy. There's lots of other elements to that story. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the cost of healthcare in America because that seems to be the biggest issue. Nowadays, even going into the midterms, it was one of the top issues, on, if not the top issue on voters' minds, was, the, was health care. And so it raises this question, there are incredible innovations coming, say the CAR-Ts in, yeah. in the cancer space, they're remarkable drugs, uh, treatments, they have um, in, incredible results in some patients, and yet those in particular come with price tags around $400,000 and people can't get them. And so we're in a period where we're seeing remarkable innovation, but prices that we don't know how to pay for. Can you talk a little bit about how you see this transpiring, what you see really, take, what, what it really will take to change the system or make it such that people are not concerned or making choices about getting that diagnostic or taking their insulin or getting that cancer therapy or you know, paying their rent? The, one of the fundamental problems in the U.S. delivery system is, as you stated, low value. And that is, we're a very high cost delivery system now, 18 going to 19% of GDP, more than twice the OECD average. And yet, on a number of different health-related outcomes measures, we rate pretty poorly in the United States. I think one of the problems we just touched on, and that is the, the reimbursement system in a fee-for-service world, there's not oftentimes a good alignment between outcomes um, and, and payments. And so that needs to be fixed through changes as are ongoing in the way healthcare is reimbursed. But also, um, really tackling the other determinants of health, which, you know, we know that the social, environmental, and behavioral determinants of health account for 70, 75%. The medical care we provide, our genetics is the other you know, 25% or so. But we've had far less focus in the United States on those social, behavioral, environmental determinants than we've had on the more traditional medical approaches. And the medical approaches have mainly been devoted to and focused on treatments and cures, not on preventions. So in a nutshell, 
that's a very, it's a very complicated thing to crack. But, but I think it's going to be a combination of how we change the reimbursement system plus a focus on the other determinants of health mm -hmm. that haven't received as much attention in the United States as they have in some other countries. It, that's interesting. You sort of think about the workplace wellness program as as the worker, the workplace stepping in, the companies who pay for the insurance themselves saying, let's take a stab at figuring out how to do the preventative work here or incentivizing people to make healthy habits. Um, but that's a long road and it's, it's hard to say how it'll work. Exactly. Um, on cost, one other topic, given you're dean of a medical school, and medical school is a very expensive um, endeavor. I believe it's around a quarter of a million dollars in tuition alone to become a doctor these days. And you sit in Silicon Valley, where the best and brightest can go into tech without needing a master's degree. No, maybe not even a college degree, actually. <laughs> um, how do you, knowing NYU recently made tuition free, how do you view the sustainability of the cost of a medical school education? Do you think what NYU is doing is maybe the right path forward? If you had the checkbook to provide it, you'd be doing the same? I do think the cost of medical education is a concern. Each institution, I think, is going to address that concern in, in a somewhat different way. At, at Stanford, our financial aid is generous and it's entirely need-based. Uh, we reason that any student who's offered admission to our medical school, we want to have come to our medical school. And we're going to do everything we can with financial aid packages. We have among the lowest graduating debt of any of our cohort of medical schools. But it's something I'm concerned about. How do we ensure that we continue to provide uh, financial aid in a meaningful way, in particular uh, the need-based aid. Now what NYU did I think was a very bold move and all of us uh, are looking carefully at, at what they did. You know, there have been those who have said, well, but what if there's still going to be people go to, they go to NYU Medical School that become neurosurgeons, and there should be, by the way, orthopedic surgeons. So is that really directing the aid where it needs to be directed? I wouldn't criticize the NYU initiative, and Columbia also took a slightly different approach, and that is to eliminate loans from their financial aid packages through a very generous gift from, from Roy Vagelos. So there, there are lots of different things that are going to be, I think, rolled out at different medical schools. But we, what's encouraging to me, back to the example you mentioned, is you're right. Students going to medical schools today could do any number of other things that have a very high probability of being more lucrative in the long run in terms of the total income they make than being a physician, even among the more highly remunerated specialties in medicine. But they choose to go into medicine. And, and it's amazing for me every year to interact with these young medical students and physicians in training and to see their dedication. And I think that dedication arises from the truly unique relationship that a patient and a physician have and, and the desire of young people today to still be trained so that they can be a steward of that relationship in the future bodes well for the future of medicine, I think.